Reading with your kids. Hola, Nihao, Konnichiwa, Assalamu alaikum, Shalom, Machaba, Ciao, Bonjour, Namaste, Jambo. Bienvenidos. Hey, my name is Jed Lee. Welcome to Reading with Your Kids. We are coming to you from the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville, located in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. We are so honored and so wicked happy that you're joining us in our mission to help all families grow closer through reading. We do that by sharing fun, thoughtful, and thought-provoking conversations with fascinating people who just happen to be writing books for kids of all ages. You can join us in that mission by telling all of your family and friends about the show and letting them know that they can hear us on the WREB AM FM 24-7 radio network. And they can find us on the iHeartRadio app, on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Good Pods, Podcast Attic, Amazon Music, Audible, wherever you find your podcast. Our guests today are pretty amazing. Later on in the show, we're going to meet Adib Karam. He'll be here to celebrate Bijan Always Wins. But our first guest is a friend of the show. She is coming back to celebrate her new book. It's called I Gotta Sing. Our guest will be the amazing Alice Faye Duncan. Before we invite Alice into the studio, we want to let you know that we have a brand new Reading With Your Kids Certified Great Read. Lillian may learn why mom and dad work. Written by Anthony Delaunay. This is a heartwarming and educational story that beautifully explains the importance of work and money to young children. The book begins with Lily and May feeling sad as they watch their father leave for work, sparking a heartfelt conversation with their mom about why both parents have jobs. The narrative skillfully introduces the concept of money and its necessity in everyday life. Through a detailed and engaging explanation, the mom helps Lily and May understand how money is used to buy food, clothes, and other essentials, and how it pays for services from doctors and dentists and even their favorite babysitter. This explanation extends to include taxes, savings, and the various professionals who contribute to their community's well-being. The story is filled with relatable scenarios and clear illustrations, making complex financial concepts accessible to young readers. The rhyming text keeps the narrative lively and engaging, while the colorful illustrations capture the children's curiosity and emotions throughout the story. One of the book's strengths is its ability to balance education with emotional resonance. The author not only teaches kids about the practical aspects of money, but also addresses their feelings of sadness when their parents leave for work. By the end of the book, Lily and May gain a sense of pride and understanding, realizing that their parents' work helps the family live better and enjoy fun activities together. Lily and May learn why mom and dad work is a valuable addition to any child's bookshelf, combining important lessons about financial literacy with the touching story of family love and support. We're, we really love the entire series by Anthony Delaunay, and we are so happy to add Lily and May learn why mom and dad work to our certified great read wall of fame. Hey, speaking of certified great reads and our certified great read wall of fame, one of our very first certified great reads is our sponsor today, Astronaut Aquanaut, How Space Science and Sea Science Interact. Jennifer Swanson takes us on a journey from the deepest trenches in the ocean to the farthest humans have ventured into space and helps us learn what it takes to explore both of these extremes. You might just be surprised by how similar the domains of astronauts and aquanauts really are. We love this book. You and your kids are going to love it too. The photographs are amazing. And of course, our dean of all things, STEM and STEAM, her writing is going to captivate your kids' attention. Pick this book up today. Astronaut, Aquanaut, How Space Science and Sea Science Interact. A great, certified, great read from our dean of all things, STEM and STEAM, Jennifer Swanson. Before we invite our guests into the studio, I would love to invite you to visit a very special website. It's clownswithoutborders.org, clownswithoutborders.org. 
This is a group that I absolutely adore. I am part of Clowns Without Borders, and I had the honor of being part of the 2023 tour of El Salvador. I had so much fun joining with artists from all over the world to bring a smile to people who really needed it and, and, and really appreciated it, too. And we would love for you to join us as a monthly joy maker. Uh, the joy makers, they're a family of people just like you who love to laugh and make other people feel good. So please take a moment and visit clownswithoutborders.org and consider joining me as a joy maker. My friends, you are in for a treat. Our guest is returning to reading with you kids to celebrate her brand new book. It's called I Gotta Sing. Please welcome back to the show, Alice Faye Duncan. Hey, Alice, how are you? Hey, Jed. I'm doing very well. Thank you so much for this second invitation. I look forward to speaking with you about my new book that you mentioned, I Gotta Sing. Yeah, it's really, you know, uh, Alice is sharing the images of the book with me, and it is this is a book that my daughter would absolutely have embraced and made me read to her again and again and again the just the joy that's on that front cover it's amazing well let me let me share with you what the book is about okay the book is about a little baby and they call it his name is is they call him big baby so the little book is about big baby jenkins hezekiah jenkins um and it is morning he has had his breakfast and it is now time for his morning bath however to avoid taking his morning bath he runs to the barnyard to sing with the barnyard animals and the the title I got to sing is taken from an African American spiritual uh, that goes by the title I've got to sing when the spirit says sing. And so, in order to make this spiritual have a updated version, uh, but with the same classic joy. I said, how could I update the spiritual so that children can have the efficacy and the the joy of it, but then make it applicable to something that's relevant to them today? And I thought about it. Mm. I was like, well, a lot of little children, not all, but a lot of little children don't like bath time. And I was like, hmm. And just the ideas came to me. I, and I began to immediately see in my mind a little boy on a farmyard and running around the, the farmyard singing with the animals to avoid going back to that house to take his daily bath. And then, because I live in Memphis, Memphis is the front door of the Mississippi Delta, and we know that the Mississippi Delta gave America original music called Delta Blues. I thought, wow, this also would be an opportunity to introduce children uh, to a Delta Blues instrument, which is called the Diddley Bow, uh, which is a, a instrument that you can either make it by tacking wire on, on a wood frame house, or you can make it by tacking wire to a broomstick and a, a, a old cigar box. And so I introduced children in the story to the uh, Mississippi Delta Diddley Bow, and then the story is also replete with lots and lots of onomatopoeia. Um, would you like to hear a chorus? Of Absolutely. The, of the All right, and so I'll, I'll just read for you a section, and it, this is, um, I'll, I'll, in fact, you know what, because we have time, I'll read for you the very beginning, and then I'll go into the first refrain. Sure. And then you can ask me other questions from there. All right, so the beginning of the story, it goes like this. I Got a Thing by Alice Faye Duncan. Big Baby keeps a morning schedule. Every day is the same tick-tock. After grits, gravy, and peach toast, he runs to find Pop Charlie in the barnyard while Great Nana fills the bath. 
see my baby, Pop Charlie cheers. What can I do for you? Sing, big baby shout. Pop Charlie grins from ear to ear as he plucks his diddly bow. He lifts his chin and crows. I gotta sing when the spirit says sing. I gotta sing when the spirit says sing. I gotta sing when the spirit says sing and shout in the spirit of the joy. And so then, so what it goes, it goes from uh, singing to then the baby gets in contact with the the cow. And Pop Charlie says with a chuckle, uh, Pop Charlie Charlie calls his longtime friend grazing in the grass. Miss Daisy, I need your help. Should we sing for this messy baby with gravy on his shirt? Miss Daisy shouts her shouts and shakes her silver bell. Her sure reply is. Move. I gotta move when the spirit says move. I gotta move when the spirit says move. I gotta move when the spirit says move and shout in the spirit of joy. And so then, you know, so then they go to the pig and they go to the barnyard dog and then they go to uh there is the rabbit and then there is there is grand the grandmother comes and finally when grandmama comes you know grandmama is now looking for that baby they have jumped they have clapped they have moved they have oinked grandma is now looking for that baby and uh about that time grand it says great nana calls hezekiah baby jenkins hurry up these steps pop charlie has work to do and it's time to take your bath Oh, but baby is not into that. Baby says, sing, sing, big baby cries. He is in no mood for the bubbles. Big baby plops to the ground. He whines and sniffles and sulks. Great Nana winks at Pop. Then she leaves to fetch clean towels. Snap, snap, snap. Pop Charlie starts the beat again. Big baby stops his crying because the good time is about to roll. Twing, twang, twing goes the diddly bow. Big Baby jumps to his feet and all the animals start to twist and turn. They boogie around the barnyard as Rufus Rabbit leads the way. And that's when they hop. I gotta hop when the spirit says hop. I gotta hop when the spirit says hop. I gotta hop when the spirit says hop and shout in the spirit of joy. This is, uh, you know, I, I have a smile that um, I don't think I've smiled this wide in a long time. It's just, I, I, I'm imagining you must have had a great time writing this book. I did. I had a great time writing the book. And what's really great about it at the end of the book, because spirituals are a classic American music. I then give children a template where they can now write a brand new song using that spiritual as a form, mm-hmm. right? And and so the lesson is is that spirituals like oftentimes like gospels they are songs that are passed down orally from family to family, generation to generation, and families and generations of pe- of people are able to then create their new version of the song. And so children are in- are encouraged then at the end of this great gospel stump to um to create their own barnyard jam, right? Um and so I'll I'll sing the end of it. Okay. Finally, Great Nana comes back. The water is ready, and she searches the yard. She she peeks inside the chicken coop and under the big red truck. She turns to Pop Charlie with a glimmer in her eye. Have you seen my sugar baby covered in grits and peaches? I can't find him anywhere. I think I'm going to cry. No, big baby giggles and shouts, Nana, here I am. 
Nana shuffles her feet with joy. Big Baby skips to Nana's side. There is no more time to tarry. Pop Charlie calls to the boy. You be good now, my little crumb snatcher. Then he plucks a parting tune. All the animals bid goodbye. Woof, oink, moo. Big Baby waves goodbye. With Great Nana at his side, they dart across the yard, singing as they go. I got to run when the spirit says run. I got to run when the spirit says run. I got to run when the spirit says run and shout in the spirit of joy. All right. Sing, clap, hop, run, and shout in the spirit of joy. I am... I, I I want to go to one of your book readings. Okay. Uh, you know, because I just know, I you know, you're beautiful. We would voice. have a ball. It's I, a ball. It's a ball. When I get there, the party starts, right? <laughs> I can tell. I, and I know if you're at a library or a bookstore or oh, school. Oh, it is the loudest story mm-hmm. time. It is the... It is the loudest story time. It is the most joyful story time. It is the, if there is such a word, it is the bestest. It is the bestest. It is the loudest. It is the, 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 the greatest. The grandiest. The grandiest. The, the joyousness. Great. Joyous. Joyous. Uh, yeah. Efficacious. Um, illuminating. Enlightening. And fun. Most of all, fun. Yeah, absolutely. Talk about an uplifting book. Uh, I, again, like I said, my, I, I, she's 28 years old right now, but I know as a five-year-old, six-year-old, seven-year-old, my daughter Alejandra would just, we'd be, we'd be singing this for, for weeks at a time. And uh, she'd be singing around the house and Every time she did something, I got to read when the spirit says read. Uh, I got to wash the dishes when the spirit says wash the dishes. Yes. And how fortuitous is that for parents? Washing dishes, reading, sweeping, vacuuming, mowing the lawn. Come on now. Yeah. Half the chilling doing all the things. Yeah. Abs- yeah. And it's just, to me, this, and especially now it seems like, um, Everybody's just looking for something to be upset about, and uh, they want to argue, and they want to, you know, just uh, complain. But this is a wonderful way to just teach kids, help kids understand that joy can be found in every moment of our lives. Absolutely, and we and we should not be banning joy, should we? Mm-mm. Mm-mm. No, we should not be banning joy, and so that's why I write. You know. Uh, someone asked me the other day, Hey, by the way, I, you know, you know, you can't see it, but I'm suffering from a broken left foot, um, that I broke last week. Ooh. And anyways, but prior to breaking my foot, um, I was doing a lot of like, you know, readings at libraries, summer camp schools and all of this. And I was somewhere and one of the camp leaders was saying, Oh, Alice, hey. Like, you know, how do you, you know, just how do you just stay so upbeat and and joyful? And I said, you know, I said I used to be a child. I was a small child once. And I experienced a variety of, um, as a small child, I experienced a variety of disappointment. That was no fault of my own. Um, You know, as a small child, I experienced a variety of disappointment that was no fault of my own. And so now that I am a grown person, that child within, I live every day to give her joy. And what makes that child within the most joyful is making other people joyful. And so when I'm writing, especially when I'm writing for preschoolers, and I Got to Sing is certainly a book for preschoolers and early elementary, when I'm writing for them, I always attempt to create something that is interactive, that is engaging, and that is joyful. And that's what I think I have achieved here with I Gotta Sing. I think I've achieved it 
because the text is fair. I think I've achieved it because there's lots and lots and oodles and oodles and oodles of onomatopoeia of sound words. And I think I have che- uh, I and I think I have achieved it because the ultimate message in the book is that each and every one of us is a joy giver and each and every every one of us we are carrying our own joy and as we carry our own joy it goes into the world and it is very contagious and then our joy connects with another person's joy and another person's joy and then what do we all do we shout with the spirit of joy we're all shouting we're all clapping we're all singing we're all operating in a spirit of joy and that's what that's certainly what the world needs now as we are bombarded with images of war, as we are bombarded with um, the, the just the reality, just the human, as we are bombard, bombarded with just the human reality of what is the life cycle, uh, you know, uh, the death of animals, the death of grandparents. Even now, you know, the death of our young friends, even when when you're a child, you know, you're experiencing these dark times. And so this book, I do believe, is a beacon of light. It's a beacon of hope. And it is joy within the pages of a book. Yeah. Well, that certainly is clear. The the illustrations are also absolutely delightful. I'm uh, imagine, you know, I'm, I'm imagining kids would... Just love to to take a, a look at these pictures and talk about the pictures. And again, every okay. every face has a huge smile on it. Grandma, grandpa, right. the baby, everybody, the animals. Everybody, everybody. Like and and what happened was in writing the book, you know, the artist and I, we were required to get together on a Zoom call with our editor. And they asked, like, Alice, you know, what do you envision for this book? And I said, I envision, like, think of a, think of a Disney, think of a Disney film from long ago and how the, the joy of the animation, uh, but also how there was a distinction in each of your characters, who many now are are classic characters. When you think of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, those are classic images, right? And I and I I asked the illustrator if he could make something. Uh, the illustrations have a very classic uh, Disney-like vibrancy, and I think that's what he did. Um, the little child, you know, big baby Hezekiah Jenkins is an adorable little curly-haired kid. Uh, Grandmother, Great Nana, is an endearing, uh, loving grandmother. Uh, Uncle, the uncle, is, you you know, Pop Charlie, is a endearing grandfather, you know, great uncle-like figure with whiskers and overalls and, and, and the animals themselves the animals themselves are drawn with movement. So also everything in the book moves. Everything in the book, as you turn from page to page, everything in the book is also moving like an animation. And so it's really, it, I think, I think it is a genius creation. Mm-hmm. Uh, not because I was the, the conduit of it, but because... I just think it, it's just really something that was God given to us as we work together in this collaboration to yeah. bring something about that would be inspiring um, and fun for kids, you yeah. know? Yeah. I, I, I love that um, idea that this is a gift because I, I, I think it is. I think, and, and I think sharing our joy with others is certainly a wonderful gift that we can give to everybody that we meet every day it is it is it is i yeah. agree yeah you know the the book in the spirit uh reminds me i i am a member of a group called clowns without borders and our mission is to travel to um 
refugee camps and disaster areas and uh, to close people who have been displaced by violence or, or whatever and just bring joy. And Well, it- I pray, you know what, I pray that in your going-ons and your travels, I pray that you will consider taking this book with you because, like, many people are familiar with my books because oftentimes I talk about nonfiction biographies like Opal Lee, Willie White, Coretta Scott King, Dr. King. But this book was something where I was very intentional that I wanted to capture music on the page so that the book itself, without any instrument, it would be a song Mm -hmm. and it would, and it could live. You know what I mean? It could be alive and living in the hearts of the kids. And so I do believe that, look, they have, they have animals on every continent. So wherever you're traveling, there are animals, right? And children love animals. They love animals as pets. They love animals as, you know, as, as just being part of their families and depending on where you're going, animals oftentimes are, you know, that people, families have livestock, right? Yep. yep. Um, and so I just, I just think that this book will probably be a gift and a blessing to you in your work, especially if you are working with children as you go. Yeah, Absolutely. We should tell everybody where they can go to find out more about I Gotta Sing, find out more about you and Opal Lee and all the other great works that you're sharing with the world. Okay, well, I am Alice Faye Duncan. That is Faye with an E. They can find me and more information about my other books at my website, which is alicefayduncan.com. I Gotta Sing will be available July 9th. Um... And it's going to be sold every place online where books are sold. And it's going to be sold and, you know, you can get it at every uh, bookstore, independent bookstore, city bookstore. If they don't have it already, you can just, and you want to order it from your local bookstore, which I encourage, then you can just call your local bookstore, say you want, I got a thing for Alice Faye Duncan, they'll order it and they can get it to you immediately i also encourage you know each one reach one so as you buy one book for your family i encourage you to buy a book for another family and then i encourage you to share and tell your your neighbors and your friends who are parents and grandparents about the joy and efficacy of this book and encourage them to get a book for their families um i envision in my mind this book traveling all around the globe with children singing, clapping, hopping, running, mooing, shouting, and dancing, having fun all around the world. Music is a universal language. Love is a universal language. Joy is universal emotion. And I think we all need to do our part to spread that goodness around. Amen. Amen. We've had a really uplifting and inspiring time speaking with the author of I Gotta Sing. It is a brand new book, song, experience from our guest, Alice Faye Duncan. My friend, Alice, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much, Jed, for the invitation. I hope to see you again. You know, I've got other books that are going to be uh, on their way in 2025, 26, and 27. And also, uh, I have a companion book with I Gotta Sing, and that companion book is This Train is Bound for Glory. So be sure to check that out. That was released last year in 2023, and it is a story about the joy of heaven. You have an open invitation, my friend. Anytime you want to come back, you are more than welcome. Thank you, Jed. Thank you. Hey, you know, the Summer Olympics, they're underway. And if you are looking for a gold medal book to read, be sure to check out Takedown by Laura Chavan. In in Takedown, Lev is determined to compete at the state wrestling championships. But then he's paired with a new partner who happens to be a girl. 
Lev and Michaela push each other to excel, but when they meet on the mat, only one can win. Takedown is a multiple award-winning and stateless nominated middle grade novel about families, friendship, and hard work. Get your copy at bookshop.org or check out the free educator's guide at laurachavan.com. Hey, I I have a quick question for you. Wouldn't it be great if you and your kids could learn about emotions simply by reading a bedtime story? Introducing Bella Santini in the land of everlasting change, the award-winning fairy tale book that captured the hearts of parents and children alike. Join Bella Santini on an unforgettable adventure through a strange and magical world. Louise Jane, she's the CEO of Golden Wizards Book Prize, says that this book is a life-changing masterpiece. It will empower children and allow them to understand themselves and the world in new ways. Strongly recommended for all parents, this captivating story improves well-being and fosters emotional growth. Bella Santini is a winner of the prestigious Golden Wizard Book Prize and is a Mom's Choice Award winner. Get your copy of Bella Santini in the Land of Everlasting Change today. A a magical journey to emotional growth awaits you. Are you looking for a creative way to bond with your kids? Let me tell you all about Drawing With Your Kids, the ultimate destination for artistic adventures. Join us as we dive into the wonderful world of children's books with renowned illustrators guiding you step by step. From beloved characters to whimsical scenes, unleash your imagination and create cherished memories together. Whether you're a seasoned artist or just picking up a pencil, there's something for everyone at Drawing With Your Kids. Please visit our website, readingwithyourkids.com, and click on the Drawing With Your Kids link at the top of the page and let the creativity flow. Drawing With Your Kids, where every stroke brings stories to life. My friends, we are in for a treat. Our guest is here today to celebrate. His brand new book is called Bijan Always Wins. Please welcome to the show, Adib Karam. Hey, Adib, how are you? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. I'm delighted to have you on. Did I pronounce your your main character's name right? Is it Bijan? Bijan. 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 Who is Bijan and why does Bijan always win? Uh, Bijan is a little, uh, Iranian American boy who is, uh, perhaps obsessed is a, the best word, obsessed with winning. He defines himself by his ability to win at anything, even things that empirically can't be won, like tying his shoes or playing with dinosaurs or eating his vegetables or even falling asleep. I think he speaks to, um, the competitive part in, in all of our childhoods. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'm thinking back to when my son was um, a, a, an adorable little boy, and uh, he would absolutely love to um, win everything. Yeah. <laughs> was, there, was there a person in your life that uh, Bijam is uh, inspired by? I don't know that he's inspired by anyone in particular, uh, so much as he is inspired by my own childhood when I went through phases of wanting to win things. And I have, I don't have any kids of my own, but I have lots of cousins with kids and uh, seeing the ways that they have had to navigate uh, play and notions of victory and defeat. And uh, it just reminded me of, of that time in life when you're kind of first learning that there are winners and losers and, Mm -hmm. and what that means. And, uh, and how early on it's uh, inculcated in all of us uh, to be a winner. Yeah. Now, what it's interesting you you use the phrase uh, when we learn that there are winners and losers and, and what that means. What did that mean? Are you able to remember what that meant to you when that kind of light dawned? Yeah, I think I'm going to date myself uh, with this. But my, like, first... My earliest memory of like knowing about winners and losers was I went to daycare when I was like four and five years old and this daycare had one Nintendo and it was like an original Nintendo entertainment system. This is the part that's dating me. 
uh, and uh, they had like Tetris and Dr. Mario and Super Mario Brothers on there. And there's the uh, the constant refrain at daycare was, I play winner, <laughs> which means if you were good at the game, you never had to give up the controller and let someone else have a turn. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, the losers just cycled through one after another with like maybe 30 minutes of screen time apiece. And, you know, that was my first introduction to video games. I was very bad at them. And so I was never the winner. I never got to go again. I always just got in and out on the on the, the endless treadmill of, of playing winner. Learning about winning and losing on a Nintendo. Yep. Yeah. Classic Nintendo entertainment system. Yeah. Well, I, you know, um, you're, not, you're not dating yourself too badly because the, the, as far as I know, they didn't have daycare centers when I was a kid. So <laughs> <laughs> Fair. So you... Uh, we love the fact that books can be windows, mirrors, and sliding glass doors. And you mentioned that Bijan is uh, Iranian-American, or as I like to say, an American of Iranian descent. Um, are we going to get a look into uh, a bit of Iranian culture? Uh, I think less so in this book than in my first picture book, which focused on a particular uh, Iranian holiday, in that case uh, Noru's, which was in my first picture book, Seven Special Somethings. I think in this one, uh, it's more in some of the art and uh, simply in his name, Bijan, because I think like many people in the Iranian diaspora, uh, you know, all of us have different experiences with our relationship to Iran and Iranian-ness. And uh, Bijan is a, a little boy in uh, sort of middle America that is much more concerned with victory than with his uh, his diasporic identity. Uh -huh, yeah. You know, it's interesting. Um, my beautiful wife and I traveled to Italy um, for, to attend the uh, International Children's Book Festival. Oh, and, in Bologna? Yeah, in Bologna. It's beautiful. What a, what a wonderful event. What a wonderful city. And we just happened to be staying at the same hotel that um, uh, a contingent of Italian um, uh, government officials, they, they were sponsoring a, um, uh, a large group of African publishers and authors at the event, the Italian government was. And so uh, the, 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 the folks from the government um, were also there at the hotel with us. So we got to know these people. And there was also – and um, an Iranian man who worked for the Italian government. And uh, it was interesting because he, he – we don't get political here on the podcast, um, but he asked my wife to do him a favor to vote for somebody that um, my wife will never vote for and um, because he didn't like what the Iranian government was doing. Um, and and so – and he thought there's one other cat. We might have to cut this out of the interview. Wait, is your wife Iranian and can vote in Iranian elections? No, no, no. She he was wondering about us voting here in the in the United States presidential elections. Oh, okay, and and had a, thought it could perhaps influence Iranian uh, government he, policy. He thought he thought the the candidate that he wanted to support would. Um, uh, Deal deal with the Iranian government in a way that he would prefer it be dealt with. Um, ah, fair. That's a lot. Of... <laughs> We're definitely going to cut this out. <laughs> Let me just go back to um, – tell me, was <laughs> – did you always aspire to be a children's author? I n never once aspired to be a children's author until I was already doing it. Uh, growing up – when I was really young, I desperately wanted to be a child actor. I thought I had the sort of personality that would have made, like, you know, been a great, like, kooky neighborhood kid on, like, a on a TGIF sitcom. Uh -huh. Like, you know, like a recurring guest star spot. I think that would have been a really good use of my talents. Uh, and then I wanted to be an astronaut. But unfortunately, I found out you had to uh, be good at math and have good vision. And I didn't have either of those things. Um, good, like, literal vision with your eyes, not, like, you know, philosophical vision, which I think I do have, uh, or artistic vision, which I think I do have. And then I became a theater kid. I uh, got my bachelor's degree in theatrical lighting design, actually. Uh, and 
uh, moved back home to Kansas City, got a job at a, a production company, and was actually very happy in that industry. But I had a lot of, uh, not like free time, but time when I was sort of downtime, like waiting for the next thing to do. And so I was writing in that downtime. And the first things I remember writing were kind of boring adult things because adults are boring. <laughs> and uh, uh, then I started reading uh, young adult literature in particular because it was really popular at the time. Like this was when Hunger Games was going strong and divergent and the fault in our stars. And I was like, oh, actually, why books are so much more interesting than, you know, reading yet another book about a middle-aged guy getting a divorce. Mm -hmm. um, it turns out books can be fun. And uh, that was really kind of my entrance into children's literature. And uh, it was really the, the advent of We Need Diverse Books that made me uh, realize that there was room for me in children's literature and um, made me realize that sort of my own convictions about what books can be uh, aligned with children's books. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I thought I was going to be a young adult author kind of exclusively, uh, but after my first young adult book, uh, Darius the Great is Not Okay, came out, uh, my agent emailed me and said, hey, uh, you know, you wrote about Noru's, the Iranian New Year in Darius, and lots of people are curious about that. Have you ever thought of writing a picture book about it? And I was like, no, should I? And she said, maybe. And so I went to the library and read about 100 picture books and uh, decided to try my hand at them. And it was not... Um, easy. I think if anything, picture books are much harder than writing for teenagers. Um, but I really fell in love with it and, and with the collaboration with an illustrator. And so, yeah, I think, yeah, I know I'm two picture books in now and third one's on the way. And uh, I have no regrets about, about the course that my life has taken. That's, that's really wonderful. You mentioned that you think picture books are harder. Is it the limit of words that you have to tell this story with only five or 600 words? Or was it, you know, thinking, oh, I have to leave a lot of space for the illustrator to, you know, add their part of the story? What, what was it that made it harder to write the picture book? I think the hardest thing about writing picture books is uh, we are so far removed from being a child who reads picture books. And, and as try as we might, as much research as we can do, as much observing of children as we can do, it's really hard to recapture what it feels like to be five years old or six years old. And I think as adults, it's really easy to accidentally or on purpose write down to them, uh, oversimplify things or try to teach things instead of just telling a good story, which is, in my experience, what most kids actually want. Uh, they are smart and they are opinionated and they are in fact just very small people. And it, it's sometimes really difficult to get out of my own way as a writer and just focus on telling a good story instead of being like, oh, you know, do I need to explain this? Will a child know what this means? Am I, you know, it's, um, yeah, I think getting out of my own way is really, really challenging. Interesting. Interesting. I, you know, I've had the same, I, I've been doing educational magic shows for 35 years. And one of the things that I, I and, and being a dad, my, my kids are now adults. I mean, really, there was a lot of media that felt like, as you said, they were t talking down to kids. They, you know, I know that, um, uh, you know, the, the music that was marketed to kids, it was this really kind of sweet and gentle almost. And it's, da, 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 da. meanwhile, my kids wanted to listen to something with a big thumping bass in it and <laughs> loud. And they wanted something that was going to get them up off their feet. And I, I think the same is true. And, and all kids media, um, there's certainly not, uh, there's certainly things that aren't appropriate for kids, um, at five and six years old. But, um, I, I think it's a real 
challenge to kind of, like you said, get out of your own, get out of your own head, out of your own way, and write a good story for kids. It really is, um, and it's funny, you know, you mentioned like the limit of of you know only five or six hundred words. I think that's one of the nicest things about writing picture books because almost any other kind of novel like book you would write you know novels uh i guess yeah unlike a novel um you know you can read an entire picture book in a day and and you can hold a picture book in your mind or at least i can hold a picture book in my mind in a way that i can't with other kinds of books and that is one of the most exciting things about it because it really lets me look at a picture book in a completely different way to any other kind of book. So, yeah, I think the, the, the word count limit is one of the most exciting things about picture books to me. Yeah. Yeah. Was it difficult um, or, or was it in the front of your mind, uh, the idea that I, I need to leave space for the illustrator to tell his or her part of the story? I think for whatever reason, I don't have a problem leaving space. I think I, I wouldn't say it's like at the front of my mind so much as it's sort of a natural part of my workflow if I think I'm working on like something illustrated. Um, you know, part of that is coming from a theater background where it was highly collaborative and we always were aware that you were one part of, you know, a whole mm -hmm. making this show happen. Uh, I also uh, spent some time studying film, in particular screenwriting, and that's another medium where you have to leave room for other artists to engage with your words. And so in that sense, I think um, writing picture books came uh, naturally to me insofar as um, giving kind of bare bones descriptions or in a minimum kind of only as needed mm -hmm. directions for blocking and uh, and really letting the illustrator have their way with it. In fact, more frequently, I have been told to add information to give the illustrators more context or paint a slightly clearer picture of what I'm seeing in my head. Mm -hmm. Because they're like, Adib, it's a little too sparse. <laughs> maybe Maybe they need a little more to go on because they cannot read your mind. Why not? I can read it perfectly. I was like, they don't need to read my mind. They're the ones with the talent. Like, <laughs> they should do what they want. <laughs> yeah. the, the notice. Sometimes they don't quite know what they want, and you should just give a little bit of context. Little bit context more. is everything. You met. You mentioned uh, you're the, getting a degree in uh, lighting design. I think is that I had. I, I had no idea that you could get a degree in that, and and how many different jobs there are, not only in theater, but you know, lighting a, a store, and uh, it, it's, it, it, I, I was fascinated, and I had an, it, an opportunity one night, um, my daughter in, in high school, she was aspiring to work in the, the live Christian music business, and so she started, the, the bands that play arenas down south, when they came up to New England, they would be playing little churches, and so she would volunteer and uh, work with these different bands, and most of the bands would come in, they'd be playing in a much uh, more intimate space, but they had the lighting. It was all designed, and you push a button, and a lot of things happened automatically. But at one of the events that, that she was working at, and I was with her, um, they just wanted to kind of go um, from scratch. And I got to hang out with them because uh, I helped set up the lights and uh, was with them when they were playing. And it was fascinating. And as the person was, you know, oh, I'm going to try to do this to add this feeling and emotion. And it was like, man, that worked. And how did, how did that just the blue and the white together makes me feel this way? It, it it's, it, it's incredible. It, uh, it really is an art form in and of itself. Yeah. And one that you don't always, I mean, it's subtle. You don't always recognize when it's affecting you. Mm -hmm. um, but in some ways that makes it even more powerful. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. If this person, I would have just been feeling things and thinking, Oh, it's the lyrics. It's the song. It's here, the energy, but you know, because like, I am going to do this to get this. I'm like, Whoa, that's like magic. 
You said that the the third book is coming out, your third picture book. Um, can we get a slight preview of that? Or, or, or yeah, um, it is announced. It's uh, called Tia's Love. Uh, it's being illustrated by Hannah Chaw. And it's uh, uh, about tea, the how tea is made, how tea is drunk, and the way it connects uh, families and communities and uh, peoples all across the world. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, and we take it for granted here. Um, just, you know, pop open a bottle of Snapple and you're drinking tea. Uh, <laughs> whereas I know in... Tea is very valid. It's allowed. Yes. I don't, I don't tea shame anyone. <laughs> well, we should tell everybody where they can go to find out more about Bijan Always Wins and find out more about you. So the easiest place to find out actually both those things is my website, adibkoram.com, A-D-I-B-K-H-O-R-R-A-M.com. And that has links to all of my books, including Bijan Always Wins, uh, all of my other ch- uh, picture books, all of my young adult and adult books. And all of my social media handles. Awesome. We've had a great time speaking to the author of Bijan Always Wins. Our guest has been Adib Koram. Adib, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. And I would love, if I could, before we sign off, to shout out uh, the illustrator for Bijan Always Wins, Michelle Tran, because I realize I've talked about her beautiful illustrations and never actually mentioned her name. And she is extremely talented and was a delight to work with. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Reading With Your Kids and have been inspired to join us for the next exciting episode of the show. We also hope that this episode inspired you to write a review and give us a rating on whatever podcasting platform you may be listening to the show on. It it really helps us, especially anybody listening on Spotify. We really would really would appreciate if you could give us a five-star review that would be amazing in the meantime we'd love for you to connect with us on social media facebook.com slash reading with your kids at reading with your kids on instagram and at gently magic on twitter be sure to check out our youtube channel youtube.com slash reading with your kids and of course our website is there for you to visit reading with your kids.com want to thank the folks who made today's show so wonderful. Of course, we're going to start by thanking our guest, Alice Faye Duncan. Be sure to check out I Gotta Sing and also Adib Karam. Be sure to check out Bajan Always Wins. I want to thank my incredibly talented team, Fatima Khan, Chris Doherty, Rory Grady, Judy Hu, Stella Sheree, Hannah Bosange, Alyssa Montiero, Riley Oluwu. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me. Most of all, we all want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And as always, thank you so very much for taking the time to make the world a better place. And you do that every single time you read with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next episode of Reading With Your Kids. Thank <laughs> you.